All right. <coughs> Uh, welcome back. I think we'll get started for today. Um, so on Wednesday, we, went, uh, we got started on uh, transport layer. So today the plan is that we'll continue where we left off and then talk a bit more on different transport layer stuff. And basically today we'll talk about, so I think the last thing we talked about on Wednesday was reliable data transfer. So we started looking at, you know, stop and wait kind of protocols. So we'll continue from there and then you know, discuss some of the drawbacks of stop and wait and then see how we can improve on that. And then we'll look at, uh, we'll get started on TCP today to see how you know, reliability is actually implemented in a real life protocol. All right, so on Wednesday we were talking about uh, transport layer and we started off saying what are the different uh, services that a transport layer protocol would usually provide. And essentially a transport layer protocol provides connectivity or a logical connection between processes running on two different computers. And it also is responsible for breaking up packets, or breaking up files into smaller packets and then sending them out. And then at the receiving end, it should put them back together. We also talked about how the, you know, services that are provided by transport layer and that are not provided by transport layer. So for example, delay and throughput guarantees are not provided by transport layer, but things like congestion control, flow control, connection setup may be provided if you want. And for that, you have to use TCP. If you want a much simpler protocol that doesn't do much beyond multiplexing and demultiplexing, you can choose UDP. So last time we got started talking about multiplexing and demultiplexing, and the whole idea here was a device may run more than one application at any given point in time. So if a data comes to the transport layer protocol and says, oh, I received a packet, it's for me, but which application protocol should I be de de delivering this packet to? That's multiplexing and demultiplexing, right? And this is and the, the transfer of data between two processes here. So one process is your transport layer protocol, maybe TCP, maybe UDP, and the other process is maybe your web browser or Skype or whatever. And this transfer is done through an API, and that particular API is what we call a socket, okay? And then last time we talked about sockets in the connectionless scenario and in the connection-oriented scenario. And then there was a, uh, towards the end I got quite a few uh, requests for clarifications and so on. So what I felt is that maybe we can spend one or two minutes to, oops, I was supposed to press the button here, right? Uh, maybe to just to uh, 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 brush up on that one more and try to clarify a bit. So one of the things that, my, you know, I think this particular figure didn't show pretty well and that may have confused this, you know, uh, here, if you see for the connectionless case, right, it just shows port numbers, whereas for the connection-oriented case, when I show oh, this is going from A to B, from B to A, it shows both port numbers and IP addresses. Whenever you send a packet out in the internet, it will always have source and destination IP addresses. So that's the same case here also. It's just that, you know, I guess I, I, these slides are from Kuros and Ross. They, they didn't bother to put in the IP address just because it's not really used for multiplexing and demultiplexing here. But the IP addresses are still there. Right? Here also we will have IP address of the source and the IP address of the destination. It's there. All right, so now let's see. Let's say you have an application running, and then this is your, let's say UDP, you want a connectionless, this is, a, this is the connectionless case, right? When you want to talk, let's say, you would have to ask the OS to create a socket for you, right? So the socket has been created. Now, there are many applications. There will be more than one transport layer, right? 
or for every application at least, you need to create a socket. So I need to be able to identify the socket, right? Which socket am I talking to? In the case of connectionless, right? The identifier for this is just the destination or my own port number. You can also say destination IP address, but that's redundant because if it has come to me, I know it's, it's for me, right? Whether I add IP address or not, it doesn't matter. So a packet comes, which socket you want to go? If it's a connectionless socket, I just need to know the port number that you want to go to, and that's how I identify you. Now let's switch and say, I have an app, but now I have TCP. Do the same thing. This is connection. Oriented. And I have created a socket. It's the same thing. It's just the way I identify it, the identifier that we will use this time will have four different things. Source IP, P-O-R-T, destination IP, destination port. Okay. Just the way, just the things that I will use to identify the port number in one case, I just look at the destination port number. In the other case, I have to look at four things. And the implication of this is, in the case of the connectionless case, let's say I have another computer A, I have another computer B, they are sending packets here, and they both say destination port Let's say this, this, this is port number 1117 for whatever reason. Right? They both say destination port is 1117. In this case, they will all pass through the same socket. I don't care about anything else. These will also say that destination, let's say this is C, IP address that I'm going to is C. Of course, we have to say that. But when it reaches the destination, which is computer number C, they will all pass through the same port. In this case, if I have A, if I have B, let's say this is still 1117. This says I want to go to 1117 at C. This also says the same thing. I want to go to 1117 at C. Here also, by the way, the message will also say what is the source port and A. It will also say what is the source port and B. All the four numbers are always there in every packet. But in the case of connectionless, for demultiplexing, I don't need all four numbers. I just need one number in the end. In the case of connection oriented, I need all four numbers. So every connection will be treated through a different port here. In this case, every connection that's going to the same destination port will go through the same socket. So here, again, let's say this will say A. I should have written more cleanly, right? 1, 7, and C. 7 and C. But this is coming from A. This is coming from B. And let's pick some port number. Let's say for whatever reason, they both choose 56. They both choose 56 here. But here, this will go through one socket whose identifier will be 1117C56A. And I would have created another socket for this guy, 
and this guy's identifier would be 1117C56B. Okay. It's just that in the connection-oriented case, port numbers are identified by four things. And if you get two packets where all the four numbers match, then only they will go through the same socket. If you get two packets where any one of these numbers don't match, they're going to go through different packets, socket, different sockets. Only if two packets have all four, source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, they're all the same, then only it passes through the same socket. In the case of connection less, only if the destination port is different, then they will go through different sockets. If the destination port is same, they're going to go through the same socket at that machine. Better than Wednesday? All right. <coughs> okay. So we talked about <coughs> ports and connection-oriented connection lists. So we spent a bit more time on this, maybe. All right. Okay. So then we got out into uh, UDP, and we saw that UDP doesn't provide much. It's a best effort. It just tries to do things for you, but there are no guarantees. And uh, you know, if, if you lose packets, it will not recover them. If it's out of order, it will not bother. Right? But it does do an error check for you. And the way it does the error check is through the calculation of a checksum. And last time we saw, <coughs> saw how the checksum was calculated. It's by adding all, we take the packet 16 bits at a time, we add any overflow, we bring it back, and then at the end, we will do a once complement. All right, and then we got started on principles of reliable data transfer. And here we started off saying, you know, how do we build reliability? Basically, <coughs> how will we recover from losses? And one way is, uh, you know, we can say, if you send a packet, I want to know if you have received it or not. So you should send an acknowledgement back to me. If I don't get an acknowledgement within some specified period of time, I have a timeout, and then I retransmit the packet. So that was the basic idea. And in this case, I only send one packet and I wait. I don't send 20 packets and wait, right? So this is stop and wait protocol. And last time, we also saw that, uh, you know, uh, we, there are special cases because of which we actually need to add sequence numbers to packets. And it's not enough to add sequence numbers to the packets. We should also add sequence number to the acknowledgments. All right. So this is sort of where we ended last time, right? So hopefully you are convinced that, uh, you know, sequ sorry, stop and wait. So we send an packet, start a timer, wait for an acknowledgement. If it comes back, we move to the next packet. Otherwise, we will retransmit after the timer expires. So this protocol works. This will always recover losses for you, right? But then in the beginning, when we said, oh, we have, when we have multiple design choices or whenever we have designed a protocol, the next question we have to ask is, is it a good design or a bad design, right? So in that sense, we should be looking at the performance of the protocol. So let's look at the performance of the protocol and let's consider a scenario like this, right? Let's say we have a link that connects a source to a destination just one link, you're directly connected. And in this link, the data rate is 1 Gbps, so pretty fast. But <clears throat> the propagation delay to go from one end of the link to the other end of the link is 15 milliseconds. Right? So if you send data, it will take 15 milliseconds to go to the other side. And then, you know, maybe that data is processed, error checking is done. And if an acknowledgement comes back, another 15 milliseconds, right? So the time between you send your data and receive an acknowledgement, 30 milliseconds, all right? And let's say my packet is 8,000 bits. So then the question I will ask you is that if I use stop and wait, how is my performance going to be? 
Now, I don't care about losses here in the sense that, you know, losses would depend upon various things. I am here interested in the throughput. How many bits per second will I observe? How many bits per second am I effectively transferring? Now, effectively, I am not going to be transferring one GBPS. Why? Because after I send a packet, I have to wait. Right? My data goes, I need to wait for an acknowledgement. It's stop and wait protocol. So there is a 30 millisecond period when I'm not doing anything. So that's a waste for me. I'm not transmitting. So the effective throughput is actually something lower. So let's see let's, uh, one way of how we usually calculate these things. Right? So, and, and we will do tutorial problems on this also. So one common way of solving this kind of, or, or you know, doing this is like this. So let's say we have A and B, right? Usually we'll draw a diagram like this. And in this case, time is the y-axis. And time is going down, right? So, so this is zero, maybe, at t equals zero. And going down is increasing time. So let's say I start by transmitting a packet at t equals zero. Let's say I just transmit one bit, a single bit. <clears throat> How long will that take to reach B? In this case, this is zero, let's say, and we said 15 milliseconds, right? So when it's 15 milliseconds, that's when that bit is going to reach B, right? That's what this diagram is showing. However, my packet is not one bit, it's 8,000 bits. So, <clears throat> transmission time is 8,000 divided by, what is it, 1 Gbps, 10 to the 9. So that's eight microseconds. Right. So it's going to take, uh, well, this is not to scale, right? Because if this is 15 milliseconds, eight microseconds is going to be very small comparatively. But I cannot draw, so I'm going to make eight microseconds a little bigger. So let's say this is this. Or let's say 0 0.008. milliseconds. At that time, the last bit of the packet has been transmitted. And then, this will take some time to reach here. This is my entire packet. And this moves through. What time do I get the last bit? This. Now, at 15.008, is it too small for you in the back? Maybe I can make it bigger. Right. At 15.008, we have received the packet. And let's say it's all good, so we should send an acknowledgement back. First bit of the acknowledgement makes its way back here. What is the size of the acknowledgement? Not specified in the question. Right? So we will just ignore transmission time for the acknowledgement. We'll just say maybe one bit or whatever. We'll just ignore. But if it was transmitted at 15.008, when will it reach on the other side? After another 15 milliseconds. So when it reaches here, this is 30 point. 008, right? Propagation time is 15 milliseconds. So now I have received my acknowledgement. So what should I do? I can go on to the next packet. All right, so this is going to come in at uh, what is 45, right? 
and 8 plus 8 is 16. Why 14, 45? Right? And then when the acknowledgement comes back, it is 60.016 milliseconds and so on. And then this pattern keeps repeating. So if I ask you effectively how many bits per second are you transmitting? During this period, you're transmitting at 1 Gbps. During this period, you're not transmitting at all, right? So there are many ways. You could take a long period of time and you see how many bits you transmitted divided by the total time. Or another option that you can do is you can say that, all right, look, here, this particular pattern keeps repeating. Right? So let me just consider this period and say within such a period how much I transmit, divide by the total time, that will give me the throughput. So here, if I'm interested in what is the rate, I could say this was, I transmitted 8,000 bits in 30.008 milliseconds. So that will give me the effective data rate going to be pretty low, quite lower than 1 Gbps. Another way in which I could get a similar indication is by looking at the utilization of the link. Utilization of the link says, you know, in this period of time, or even if I look at a large period of time, what fraction of time is my link being used? Ideally, if you've you know, rented or leased a link from, from the telco, you want to use it all the time. You don't want to wait, right? So what fraction of time am I actually using the link here? That's called the utilization. In this case, I was transmitting for this many time. Out of right, so this is the fraction of time link is in use. Use means you're actually transmitting data. And this is pretty poor. Three zeros, two, seven. You're not even using it 1% of the time. So most of the time, your link is idle. So you're not going to see 1 Gbps there anyway, right? And actually, this comes out to be 33 Kbps or something. Somehow it has been converted to bytes, yeah. So you, you paid for a 1 Gbps link, you're getting 33 Kbps effectively. So that's not so good, right? So the conclusion then is, you know, even though it's a reasonably good design, I mean good in the sense that it, 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 it's a correct design, it, gives, it does what it is supposed to do, but it does it very, very inefficiently. Right? So the link utilization is pretty low. And this is the same figure that I had drawn earlier. Right? So what can we do? in order to improve this. And the solution is that, you know, you think back, why, why is my p protocol performing so poorly? The answer is, I, tra I transmitted one packet very, very quickly, and most of the time I was just sitting idle. So one intuitive solution is, <clears throat> what if I allowed you to send more than one packet at a time? Maybe you can send 20 packets and then wait for an acknowledgement, right? So that is what is called pipelining. That means you try to fill your, your wire or your pipe, and you don't have to wait for the acknowledgement yet. Maybe you're allowed to send 5, 10, 15, a certain number of packets before I tell you you've got to wait. Okay? 
And we will start off with a basic example of this pipeline and then look at, uh, you know, go back in and selective repeat, which are specific implementations. Yes? So why do you think the denominator the calculation time? At the denominator? Uh, the denominator. Oh, here I am trying to calculate the utilization. That's the time you are using the link. If I am looking here, it's the propagation. <clears throat> okay, I understand what. So, so, so I, 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 I understand where where you're coming from. But I am the user, right? What fraction of time am I pumping bits into the wire? Let's put it that way. Right? I pump bits into the wire only in the first eight microseconds or so. Then I didn't pump in. I stopped. But if I didn't have to, I could continue pumping in more and more bits. So it's in that sense when I say you're not using the link or using the link. Of course, you're right that my, my bits were actually moving in the wire. So in that sense, I was using the link. But I was not pumping in bits at the time. So. That's the interpretation for this. Yeah. <coughs> okay. So how will I do this pipelining? Let's take an example and see how it improves. Let's say instead of, I say instead of sending one packet and then you got to wait, I let you send three packets and then you have to wait. So this is an example of that. So I send one packet, two packets, three packets, and then I have to stop. When the acknowledgement comes back for the first packet that I sent right here, then I can send a new packet. When the acknowledgement for the second packet comes in, I'm allowed to send one new packet. When the acknowledgement for the third packet comes in, I can send the third packet. So another way of thinking about it is, in this version, I am allowed to have at any point at most three unacknowledged packets, not more than that. So anytime a new acknowledgement comes in, I'm allowed to send a new packet, but I cannot have more than three unacknowledged packets at any point in time. So now in this case, previously my, my, in my figure, you know, we had, the, 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 this was the, uh, oh, I could have done it here itself, right? So in my figure previously, in my previous version of just pure vanilla uh, stop and wait, this is the repetition, right? So I send one packet, I have to wait for the acknowledgement, and then this pattern repeats. In this case, what will happen? One, two, three packets being sent, and then when the first acknowledgement comes back, basically the same thing will be repeated again. So I need to look at this same time frame and then see what is the utilization. Now, of course, if I look at the utilization here, instead of just eight microseconds, I have three times that. So my numerator, instead of eight, becomes 24. And again, if you see from the start here till the point when the pattern repeats again, it's the same. It's 30.008 as before, because that's the time when the first packet goes and the acknowledgement for the first packet comes back, that's 30.008, and then my pattern repeats again. So the denominator doesn't change, but the numerator changes because I am spending three times the time as compared to before pumping in bits into the wire. So my utilization has gone up by a factor of three. Right? So that basically says, if I allow you to send more than one unacknowledged packet at a time, my ut utilization will improve. And this is the concept of pipelining in general. But when it comes to actual developing protocols based on this, you can have many, many, many different possibilities. And there are two main families of go back of, of pipeline protocols. One is called go back N. And then the other is called selective repeat. Okay? So we'll look at both of these. And in both, 
I can define some number n, maybe 5, maybe 20, whatever, some n, and I say that the sender can have at any point at most n unacknowledged packets that it has sent. Beyond that, it cannot. Once it gets an acknowledgement, it can send a new, but any point, more, not more than n. There are some diff so this is the common part in both protocols. Right? This part is the same. But then the rest is a bit different. In the case of go back n, we use something called cumulative acknowledgement. So the idea of cumulative acknowledgement, and I'll show you with, a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with an example, is that it acknowledges, if I send an acknowledgement, the number that I put in there says I have acknowledged, I have received correctly so far. I know from my experience it's a bit difficult to visualize in your head what's going on, so I'll show you with a figure what this unacknowledged, what this cumulative acknowledgement, just give me a minute, okay? And we also maintain a timer. Now I can have n unacknowledged packet, right? In the previous case, I had three unacknowledged packets. I don't have three timers. I only run one timer. And it's for the oldest packet. Okay, so now let's, let's go back and see how, how this operates. But it's what we call a window-based protocol. Let me show you with an example what these windows mean and so on. Then the slides will be much more easier to follow, okay? So let me go back to go to my animation as soon as this thing decides to show me. Yeah. All right. So here I have an animation, and you see there is a, there's a, there's a, there's a row of boxes and another row of boxes. So the top is the sender, and the bottom is the receiver, okay? And we have numbered the packets, one, zero, one, two, three, four, all the way. And at the bottom also, the receiver expects. Now, this is go back N, and this is a pipeline protocol. And so I am allowed to send a certain number of packets and then wait for acknowledgments, right? And in this example, I'm allowing five packets. So N is five. So here you see there is a box this is what we call the window. And this says, if you want, at this point, you're allowed to send 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So five packets. These are the packets I'm allowed to send. What if the application gave me a sixth packet, which is five? You're not allowed to send that one. Okay. So only packets within the window are you're allowed to send. And at the very beginning, when things are initialized, the window will start at 0 and go up to four, right? That's the idea. At the receiver side, there is also a window, and that is at zero, because this is the packet it is expecting now. When I initialize things, the receiver wants packet number zero. Okay? So let's start. Let's say I send packet number zero out, right? Packet number zero is moving, and then maybe I'll make it a bit slower. And then, you know, if the, if the application gives other packets, they will also be sent out. Right? Now, packet number zero is almost about to reach, right? And maybe a bit faster. And when it reaches zero, when it, when it reaches the destination, it was expecting packet number zero. It's all good. So it will send an acknowledgement back. And the acknowledgement will say, I have received up to packet zero. And then the window at the receiver moves one position to indicate that now it's expecting packet number one. All right? So we can resume this. And then packet number one has almost arrived. And we can see that when packet number well, it went too fast, right? Back when packet number one was received, acknowledgement came out saying one. Acknowledgement came out saying two. And then we can resume. And now when acknowledgement for packet number zero is received, my window will slide. Right? Because at any point, I can do five unacknowledged. Zero has already been acknowledged. One, two, three, four, five. I can send them if I want. All right. 
So, let's resume, let's make it smaller, and let's send out three new packets. Okay? And as you see, when packet, the acknowledgements for one and two are received, the window will shift by one each. Hopefully, it's not too fast, and then we can see individually. Yeah, it's shifted by two. Now, what I can do to make things interesting, let's delete that packet, okay? So I just killed packet number three. So it's not going to get packet three, so there's a packet loss somewhere in the network, right? And that, this is now the interesting part. And right now, there is a timer running for packet number three, because that is the oldest packet. Okay? So let's resume. And what we will see is, it's interesting, is what happens when packet number four is received. At the receiver, what are we expecting? Packet number three. But it is getting packet number four. So the acknowledgement says two. And that is the whole concept of a cumulative acknowledgement. When I get when I do cumulative acknowledgements, the number that I send corresponds to till how much have I received correctly in sequence. You give me packet four, but that is out of sequence. I'm still waiting for three. So the acknowledgement that I'm going to send back is only going to say two. Because so far, I have only received up to two in sequence. Cumulative acknowledgement says up to this number is what I have received correctly. Beyond that, I don't know. Also, we received four here, right? That's out of sequence. What should I do? In go back n, it's a perfectly good packet. It's just that it's out of order. In go back n, we throw it away. We don't keep it. Receiver throws it away. I will come back to why. There are two reasons, right? Anyway, just remember that it, it, it does that. So let's resume. And then, you know, maybe I make it faster a bit. And when these two acknowledgments come, the window will not change because I still am waiting for three. Until and unless I get the acknowledgement for three, my window is not going to shift. And now what is happening is, Application is not giving me new data, so I cannot send out 6 and 7. If it gives, I'm still allowed to send 6, and I'm still allowed to send 7, right? But I cannot send beyond that. And now a timer is running, and at some point, that timer will expire, and then we will do a retransmission. And even for 6 and 7, the acknowledgement still says 2, because I'm doing cumulative acknowledgements, and it's only up to 2 that I have received so far. And when the timer expires, we will do a retransmission. Maybe. Faster. <laughs> Timeout value is pretty high. All right. The timer expired. And then it's retransmitting. And the special thing about go back n is it retransmits everything in the window. You remember 4, 5, 6, and 7 were all received correctly. But my cumulative acknowledgments don't really say that I have received 4, I have received 5. It just says I'm, I have received up to 2, so I'm expecting 3. So in go back n, we retransmit. So in a way, it's a bit wasteful, right? So previously, uh, three, four, five, sorry, four, five, six, and seven were received correctly, but we just ignored it. We are going to retransmit the whole window anyway. But on the other hand, it made my receiver design very easy. It's simple. Is this the packet I'm expecting? I'm expecting three. I got four. Is it the one I'm expecting? No. Just throw it away, and that's it. Send a cumulative act, and we are done. And if I don't do anything funny here, let's say all five were received correctly, they will go, 
and then my window will slide forward. Questions? Yeah. All right. If your acknowledgement is lost, the sender has no way of knowing that it has been received correctly. It will still stop and keep waiting. Okay, let's try that. I'll make it a bit slower. <coughs> Right, the acknowledgments are coming. Let's say, let's leave this guy. Let me kill this guy. Right? So now I have killed one acknowledgement. Eight comes in, so that's going to move the window forward. But, all right. So in this case, we are doing cumulative acknowledgments. Even though, yeah, even though we did not get an explicit signal saying, I have received, I can't remember, nine. But when the acknowledge, maybe, let, let, let's do this again. All right, so that will be easier. All right, I sent out five packets. All of them were received correctly, right? So that's your assumption, and then things are moving back. Even if this acknowledgement is lost, if you look at the next one, this was received correctly. And the receiver does cumulative. And when I get 15 as the acknowledgement number, I know that everything till 15 has been received correctly. I don't need an acknowledgement that explicitly says I got 14. I can kill this hopefully also now. Right? Let's kill these two also. When that 17 comes in, it will say, I have received everything till 17. So my window will slide forward. Other questions? All right. Yeah. So you mean that, so, 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 I, 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 <laughs> I cannot rewind this thing, so let me reset this thing, okay? Let, let's send out five packets, and you tell me what you want to do. Yes. Will all five packets reach correctly? Uh, yes. All right. So all five packets are reaching correctly. In that case, all the acknowledgments will go out. Or this was not what you were intending. You want me to reset? All right. It's okay. I will send out five packets, and you let me know what you want to do. Mm. We kill one and two. Okay. So now what will happen is this guy, the acknowledgement will go back saying zero, and these two will go back saying Again, zero and zero. So the, it only sends out packet one, two, when the timer is expiring. Isn't that really the reason? Yes. So what you are saying is that I'm waiting for one and two, but I got two acknowledgments. You want to send out one and two yes. immediately. Yes, and when we talk about TCP, we will see some version of this. But the argument here is that, you know, in the network, every packet is independent. Maybe they will get one and two. It's just that they're taking a longer route. So I'm not exactly sure whether the packet is lost or it's just taking a little bit longer for those two guys. Right? But when we come to TCP, 
we will see that sometimes we may not have to wait for the timer. At some point, maybe we can have an intelligent guess that says now maybe we can transmit anyway. But you are right that, yeah, we are waiting unnecessarily maybe, but there is also a valid reason. Not all packets follow the same route. Some packet may have gone this way, so maybe we expect the acknowledgement to come back in a little while. Another thing, this is an animation where the timeout value was extremely large, right? So maybe that's, yeah, if, if the timeout value is not so large, maybe it won't be so bad, but yeah. All right, so that was go back n, right? And this is sort of a, a, a description of what I was describing in, in, in my animation, right? So, so you can go through that just for your, and this is another illustration of the same thing. Okay, so one of the problems with go back n is, as you saw, the receiver got the packet. It's just out of sequence, so it throws it away. You can argue that, yeah, sure, the design is simple, but it's wasteful. You got the packet correctly, it's just out of sequence. Why don't you store it for a while? Right? And in go back n, Anytime there's a timeout, I retransmit the whole window of packets. And these packets I have transmitted once before already. Maybe not all of them were lost, right? So in order to, if you don't like this and you want to make your protocol a little bit more efficient, even though at the cost of maybe more complexity, then you have the option of selective repeat. In this case, the main difference is every packet that you send will be acknowledged individually. So no more cumulative acknowledgement. If you get packet five, you send an acknowledgement saying, I got packet five. You don't get packet six, but you got packet seven, you will send an acknowledgement back saying, I got packet seven. And you will store packet number seven in your, in your memory. Also, in go back n, any time a timer a timeout occurred, I resent everything. So there was only one timer at any point for the oldest packet. Here, if if a timeout occurs, I don't have to resend everything. I only send the packet for which the timer expired, which also implies that if there are n packets in the window. I have n different timers running, one for each one of those packets. And whenever a timer expires, I will retransmit the, that particular packet. Okay. So if I want to, again, show you through this, I think it's much easier. So again, we have the sender on top and the receiver at the bottom. And again, we are going with a window of five. Another difference compared to go back n, in go back n, the receiver had a window two but its size was one because it only cares about what is the next packet I'm expecting. And out of sequence packets were thrown away. But in selective repeat, even if you give me out of sequence, I will keep it. So the window is also of size n. Right? So what we can do is Oh, I should have clicked more, right? And let me kill this packet maybe. So I sent one, two, three, four, and I have killed packet number three. So when packet zero was received, an acknowledgement went back saying packet zero. And then my window moved at the receiver. And then when packet two is received, Sorry, packet one is received, we get an acknowledgement for one. Packet number two, I get an acknowledgement for two, and then the window moves. But since I killed packet three, it has not been received. So the receiver's window will get stuck at three. But when packet number four comes, it, gets an it sends an acknowledgement saying four. So it's not cumulative anymore, it's all individual, packet, individual acknowledgements. And when one and two are received, the window will move forward. But when the acknowledgement for four is received, the window doesn't move because three is still unacknowledged. And I can, of course, send out more packets. 
and then these will be acknowledged, but then my window will not move forward. And at some point, there will be a timeout, and only packet number three will be retransmitted. Four, five, and four, five, six, and seven will not be retransmitted. Yep. And now the window can move all the way forward. And again, as before, you know, I can send these things out. And if I kill any of the acknowledgments, now in this case, the window will get stuck there. In the case of go back n, since it was cumulative, my window would have slid forward. In this case, my window will not slide because you're acknowledging individual packets. Your question previously, the window would have moved because it was cumulative, right? So here, individuals, so you get. Uh, I think the retransmission is done already in the meantime. Uh, questions? Okay. So that was sort of our, you know, and then uh, we have these slides that uh, talk about, uh, you know, what I was just showing you earlier. Uh, again, we have a uh, you know, window of N, and if you get an out-of-sequence packet, you will buffer it, and, and so on. Okay, and then this is more of, more or less telling you in, 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 in a more algorithmic way uh, what we should do if, uh, if uh, uh, in, uh, in the case of various events. All right, and this is one more example of, of that. All right. So that was sort of a basic description of how, or a fundamental discussion on how we do reliability in, in networks, right? So these were basic concepts, stop and wait works, but the efficiency is poor, so we can go pipelining. And even when we want to do pipelining, we have options. We can do go back n, we can do selective repeat, and we can also have many others. So now let's look at a real life protocol, which is TCP, and see how that operates and how it actually uses these pipelining and reliability. And what we will see is real life is usually more complex, and TCP implementations are something of a hybrid. Partially go back n, and partially selective repeat. Right? It's somewhere in, in, in between. And they also have, over the years, come up with many different modifications and enhancements to improve the performance, and we'll, we'll get into that. All right, so let's talk about TCP. So TCP has evolved over time, right? And then the oldest version of TCP is, if you want to read the standards, you Google RFC 793, you will get the first version. And then, you know, TCP, different versions, enhancements, there are many different RFCs. All right, so let's look at some proper get started, right? So first thing about TCP is it is point to point. That means a TCP connection will connect one source to one destination. It's not like one source or multiple destinations, right? So one to one, it's a connection. It is a reliable protocol which means if there are any packet losses, TCP will recover them for you. So reliability will be built in, and we will see it's a combination of go back n and selective repeat in some sense. Also, this is what is called a byte stream protocol. That means whatever the application gives to TCP, TCP thinks of it as, oh, the application will give me a whole string of bytes. It doesn't know any structure. It doesn't know where the boundaries are for your data. Maybe you're giving a table, doesn't care. It will treat them byte by byte by byte, right? And what we will see that this has a very funny implication in the how we do the sequence numbering in TCP. Intuitively, the way we do sequence numbering is packet one, packet two, or packet zero, packet one, packet two. 
we count in number of packets, right? That's very natural for us. TCP doesn't count in packets. It counts in how many bytes, and I'll show that to you. TCP is a pipeline protocol. That means it's not stop and wait. It allows you to send multiple packets at a time. How many packets at a time? Is it five? Is it 10? In the Back in the 70s and 80s, it used to be like that. N was fixed. But very soon we realized that that's not a good idea. So even though TCP is a pipeline protocol, that N, how many packets can I send, varies over time. And there's a whole algorithm called the TCP's congestion control algorithm that determines at this moment what should be N. Okay. So again, pipeline, but real life is more complicated. The size that's allowed for you, the number of unacknowledged packets that is allowed, changes over time. And it's actually a function of many different things, and we will look at it, for example, congestion and other things. Other properties of TCP, it's full duplex, which means when you open a TCP connection, I can send to you in that connection, and at the same time, you can also send data to me in that connection. Okay? It's not like if I open a connection with you, only I can send. That would be what we call a simplex. But in a duplex, it's both ways. And it's full duplex, means we can use the same connection for me sending to you and you sending back to me. And uh, usually, you know, uh, when the application gives me, gives TCP data, it will take a certain number of bytes and create a packet. TCP calls packets as segments, right? What will be the size of this packet or the segment? Usually, in the back in the old days, different networks were different or different links were very, very different. So you would negotiate. What is the maximum packet size we should use? So there is something called MSS or maximum segment size that is associated with every TCP connection. Usually, it is 2048 bytes. Okay, but most TCP packets are also 1,400 bytes or something. But maximum is usually 2048. <clears throat> it's a connection-oriented protocol. That means before we can send data, we need to establish a connection. I need to contact you and say, you know, I want to send data to you or I want to exchange something with you. Are you willing? If you are willing, you will send an acknowledgement back, and then we say we have established a connection, and now the actual exchange of data can happen. Today we will look at TCP connection setup, how that is done. Okay. And then it also does things such as flow control and congestion control that we talked about last time. Let's look at how TCP packet looks like. Okay. And just like when we were talking on Wednesday, the way we interpret this is every row is 32 bits, okay. four bytes each. Just like UDP, oops, sorry, no, wrong way. Just like UDP, the first 16 bits are the source port number, and then the next 16 bits are the destination port number. Again, this is useful for identifying the socket that you want to go to. Right? Then we use 32 bits for sequence number. Right? Since this is a reliable protocol, we have to use sequence number for packets. And just we will show in a, see in a bit that the sequence numbers, how we count them. It's usually in terms of bytes. And it's a bidirectional thing, right? We saw that it's full duplex. So I send you data. You can also send me data. When I send you data, I need to add the sequence number of the packet. But since you can also send me data, I would have to send acknowledgments back to you. And when I send acknowledgement back to you, acknowledgement packets should also have a sequence number. So this is used for acknowledging the data from the other side. The, acknowledge the, this, the acknowledgement number 
is the sequence number of the data from the other side that I'm acknowledging. Below the next 16 bits, some of it is not used, some of it is used. The first four bits here is the header length. Okay. This is the header length. And this says how many bytes of header are there. In the case of UDP, headers were always eight bytes. Right? Two rows, 32 bits, 32 bits, UDP. So 32 is four, four plus four is eight. UDP headers are constant at eight bytes. In TCP, the size of the headers can change. The reason they can change is you have the option of adding options to your header. For example, just now we talked about MSS, right? The maximum segment size. How do I know how, what should be the maximum segment size? Usually there may be some negotiation involved. So when you're negotiating, those things are put in the options field. Sometimes you have to set this, sometimes, right? After the negotiation is done, I don't need that part anymore. So then the header size will shrink. Similarly, TCP gives you the option that if you want, do you want to put a timestamp on your packet when you're sending it? Sometimes that may be useful for certain applications. So if you put a timestamp on your packet saying, I sent this packet at 17.04 p.m., or whatever, right? then you would put that as part of your header. But then if you do that, your header size will be more than the you know, six rows or seven rows or whatever. But for all practical purposes, we don't really use these extra headers. They're very rare. But they may be there, so we have to tell what is the header length. Okay. Then there are these, so six plus four, 10. So there are these six bits which are unused. And the reason they're unused is, you know, whenever you design a protocol, you have to think about what may happen in the future. You may think that right now, these are the functionalities I'm providing. So I need these fields, these things in the header. But maybe 20 years down the line, there may be new things that have to be accommodated. So you always keep some space for these future expansions. So there are these bits which are unused. And right now, actually two of them, you have the option of using, but yeah. But then after that, there are six bits that are used as flag. Look at this U-A-P-R-S-F kind of thing. Okay, so the last three bits, the R, S, and F, we use them during connection setup, you know, the handshaking for setting up the connection. And if you have set up a connection, when you're done, you're also supposed to terminate that connection, close the connection. So those flags, the R, S, and F, will be used during connection setup and connection teardown. And I'll show you how those bits are being used. Then before R, you have the P bit, which stands for push. If you have set up the P bit to be one, you are telling the receiver that whatever data is here, please give it to the application immediately. Right? Usually also, you know, receivers will give the data as soon as they receive, but in the old days, you know, sometimes the machines may be slow, they may be doing other things. So as soon as you get, if you get a, date, if you get a TCP packet with the P bit set to one, the transport layer protocol or the TCP protocol at the receiver should give the data immediately to the application. Again, today we don't really use it, not much use. And then you have something called, uh, then we have the A bit, which is for acknowledgement. We have the acknowledgement number field here. And I said that this is used if you're acknowledging data from the other side. But maybe the other side never sent you any data. Then this 
field has no meaning. In that case, you will set A equals 0. If A equals 1, that means the contents in the acknowledgement number field, they're valid. And in most TCP things, you will see that this will be set to 1. Okay. And in the beginning, we have this U. U stands for urgent data. Again, if you have some part of the data here which you think is urgent, you can indicate that to the other side. And I have some urgent data. In that case, you will put U equals 1. And not all the data in the packet may be urgent. Maybe everything is urgent, maybe everything is not urgent. Let's say only a fraction of your data is urgent. So in that case, you will have a pointer here called urgent data pointer, which will say till which part the data is urgent, starting from the beginning. The urgent data always is at the top, but how many bytes are the urgent data? That's the urgent data pointer's job. Again, in practice, not used. We don't really do urgent data and so on. Okay, but you have to remember that this, these protocols were developed back in the 70s. And at the time, you know, people had visions for different things that might happen in the future, and these things might be important. So they put these things in, but it's not, not, that, that, not, not used anymore. And just like you had in UDP case, we also have a checksum, and this is calculated in exactly the same way as for UDP. And we have one last thing which I didn't talk about, that is this field, which is the receive window. Wednesday, we talked about flow control, where you tell the other side, if you are a slow machine, your buffer is filling up, you don't have space to get more data, you tell the other side to slow down, right? This receive field is used for that purpose. You explicitly say here how many bytes you still have available in your memory. So if you have 20K available in your memory, you would put 20K there. So the other side knows not to send you more than 20 kilobytes. I will come back again, but, but that's the idea of the receive window. Questions? Let's look at the sequence numbers a bit now then. Okay? And the whole idea of sequence numbers is still the same as we had in go back and right? We have a window. You can send data within that window. On this side of the window, just like we had in our animation, this is the data that has already been acknowledged. And outside the window on this side, you cannot send this data. And even within the window, this is what you're allowed to send. Some of it you may have used because the application has given you the data. And this part, the application has not given you the data, the blue part. If application gives you the data, then you can send it, just like we had in our animation. Okay. And <clears throat> this is how you know we would interpret <coughs> sorry. This is how we would interpret. Uh, the sequence number now, let's come to that, right? The sequence number will always indicate the, 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 the packets you're sending, except that in the case of TCP, we don't count in terms of packets, we count in terms of bytes. So let's see how, what that means, and then let me show you with this. Let's take an example of a protocol, application protocol, which is not in very much use these days. But when I was a student back in the 90s, this is what I used when I go to the computer center. And you know, uh, back then, you know, most people didn't have their own computers. Even if you come to a university, you don't see PCs and laptops, of course. The computer center would have one mainframe computer, a very large computer. And what you would have in front of you is just a simple monitor. No CPU, nothing, no memory. 
you just have a monitor and a keyboard. Whatever you type goes to the mainframe computer in the computer center and then echoes back. So if I write, if I type X on my computer here on, on my keyboard, that X would go to the computer center, the computer there will register, and then echo it back to me, send X back to me, so I can see that on my screen. And this particular protocol was called Telnet. And the version that you have available now is called SSH, if you have ever used SSH, Secure Shell. Anyway, so in Telnet, what you have to imagine is, if I send any character to the mainframe, it will echo it back to me. So let's say this is me, and this is the computer center. And let's say so far, I have sent 41 bytes. Okay, And on this side, so far, it has sent me 78 bytes. I have sent 41 bytes so far, and B has sent 78 bytes to me so far. Now I type C. So I type C here. So immediately this C should go to the other side. How? Through TCP. Telnet uses TCP. So my data packet the data part, so if you look at the header, header will be there. And let's say if there are no options, this is 20 bytes. TCP headers in general are 20 bytes. So 20 bytes of header are there. And I just have one byte in my data, which is the letter C. Of course, it doesn't say C. It's the ASCII version of C or whatever, but one byte. So my data is just one byte. So now let's see what's going to happen. So when this one byte packet goes, the sequence number goes to 42, saying this is byte number, this is the 42nd byte that I'm sending you. And every data packet also acknowledges the other side. How much have I received from you so far? So far, I have received 78 bytes from you. And this is one of the quirky or funny things in TCP, the way TCP acknowledgments work. It's cumulative acknowledgment with a twist. And the twist is, it doesn't say I have received 78 so far. It says 79, saying I am expecting 79 from you which is the same as saying I have received 78 so far, but TCP doesn't say 78, it says 79 to say, please give me 79. That's what TCP is. It says X plus 1, essentially. That means I have received up to X, give me X plus 1. So the way you should interpret this 79 is, I have received up to 78, I'm looking for 79. Okay. And the data will be C. Let's say no errors, nothing. B gets this packet. So what should I do? I should acknowledge it. Now you have two choices. You could send a separate, just an acknowledgement packet. And in Telnet, I not only acknowledge, but I should also resend, echo back C to the, to the, to the, to the sender, right? So I could send acknowledgement as a separate packet and then the C as a second packet, but that's wasteful. So what we do is we call piggybacking of the acknowledgement on the data. So I send a data packet with C, and in that I also use the acknowledgement field. It's just more efficient. So what the, not this guy.
Now my data has reached the mainframe, right? The mainframe is replying. Mainframe will echo back C here, and it's also going to use the acknowledgement number field to tell me that I am acknowledging the data that you sent me. So it has now received up to 42, right? The C was the 42nd byte. So when it sends an acknowledgement, it says 43. Again, I have received up to 42. Now I want 43. And it's sending me C back. Previously, it has sent up to byte number 78. So the sequence number here will be 79. And I have received it now. Let's say I don't have any more data to send, but I should still acknowledge this data packet that I just received from the other side, right? Because it has some data. As far as I'm concerned, B sent me data, which is C. So I should acknowledge it. When I'm acknowledging it, now I don't have any more data, let's say. So, Or, or, you know, in this case, the acknowledgement will say 780 because I just received byte number 79. So now I'm expecting 80. And my sequence number, even though there's no data here, will, will point to the next sequence number, which is 43. This was an example with just one bytes of data, which is not very common. Let's me draw another example for you here, which will show you how these sequence numbers also will give you another version of this, right? A and B. Let's say so far, I have sent 100 bytes. And this guy has sent 263 bytes. Let's say I send a packet to this guy where with, let's say, 20 bytes of data. So what will I do? I will create a packet with headers and so on, and there are 20 bytes of data here. Right? Previously, I have sent up to 100 bytes. So what I have is byte number 101, 102, all the way up to byte number 120. Right? So when I send this packet, the sequence number is 101 because that is the sequence number of the first byte of this packet. And the acknowledgement field here will say, I am looking for 264. And there are 20 bytes of data here. When the acknowledgement for this comes back, let's say the packet has been received correctly. So here, it has received all the way from zero up to 120, right? So the acknowledgement here will say, I am looking for 121. Maybe now I make another packet, and this time I have 40 bytes of data. And I have another packet, let's say with 60 bytes of data. So again, I will construct packets for these. Like there'll be headers and there'll be 40 bytes here, but that one will start at 121, go up to 160. And this guy will be another packet of its own. Headers are there. 
starting at 161, how much? 220, right? 60 bytes of data here. So when I send out this particular packet, the sequence number will be 121, the sequence number of the first byte of the packet. And the ACK will still say, I'm looking for 264 from your side. Right? And when I send the next packet, the sequence number of that is the sequence number of the first byte in the packet. That's going to be 161. And then, this is still saying, you haven't given me anything, I'm still looking for 264. When the acknowledgement for this goes back, this ACK will say, I have received till 160, give me 161. And when this ACK goes out, it will say, I have received till 220, give me 221. Okay. Now let's do some interesting, or yeah, to me it's interesting. Uh, let's do some things and say, what happens if this ACK never makes it? Right? But this guy does. This is cumulative acknowledgement. So A will know that everything till 160 has been received. So it doesn't need to see a, an acknowledgement for every packet. As long as it sees one packet saying acknowledging 161, it knows that it's done. What if this packet never reached, but the next one went. Then, of course, this act would not have been sent anyway, right? But this particular act wouldn't have said 121, uh, sorry, 221. It would have still said, I am looking for 121. Right? Because I have not received this packet. And TCP sends cumulative acknowledgments, so it will still say what is the next in sequence byte it is looking for. It next in sequence it is looking for is 121, so the acknowledgement will still be 121. What should it do with this packet that it just got? It's out of sequence. If it was go back n, we should have thrown it. If it is selective repeat, we should keep it. And it turns out that TCP standards doesn't say anything. Do whatever you want to do. Right? But throwing away is wasteful, so most actual implementations of TCP will actually keep the packet. And we'll see how we deal with losses in this slide. Questions? Yeah. So yeah. Just now we talked about both go back and uh, repeat. In what, so the question is, in what, under what cases would, uh, you know, go back and be better than selective repeat? Uh, for example, if your concern is simplicity, you don't, you want the receiver to be very simple in terms of code, go back and is simpler because 
you don't have to keep or store out of sequence packets. When a packet comes in, you have to find out where it goes. It's very simple. If it is, if it is in, in order, fine, otherwise just throw it away. Sender side also simpler uh, because, for example, you have only one timer for the oldest one. So it's more about simplicity versus complexity. In terms of performance, it's difficult to say, uh, but in general, selective repeat is better. Just because you, will, you, you don't throw away out of order packets, and when a timeout occurs, you don't have to resend the whole thing again, whole window again. So in general, performance-wise, selective repeat will be better. Only one thing is that, uh, you know, if the acknowledgement gets lost, let's say one of the acknowledgements gets lost in selective repeat, your receiver window will still be stuck. Let's say acknowledgement or five is lost, but it was received correctly. Six and seven, you get the acknowledgement, but your window will still be at five. But in the case of go back n, it's cumulative. Even though you lost the act for five, six and seven will cumulatively acknowledge everything till seven. So your receiver window can move. So it's a bit difficult to give you a blanket answer saying, it will always be better because you may be unlucky and you only see your acknowledgements being lost. Okay? But the, in general, losses are symmetric to some extent. And in that case, selective repeat will perform better in terms of throughput. But your implementation is simpler for go back in. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I'm that there's a uh, algorithm to determine the subwindow sensor. Yes, in TCP. Yes, but when it changes, like, uh, do you have to wait until the pipeline finish first, then you change the subwindow sensor if you were to change it? Mm, well, <laughs> the answer is no. The in reality, and we'll see this, TCP changes its window size, N, when it receives acknowledgments. So let's say I sent five packets. Every time I get an acknowledgment, I recompute what my window should be. So I sent five, five. I will be getting five acknowledgments. As soon as I get the first acknowledgment back, I will do a computation. When the second acknowledgement comes, I will do another computation. So I don't wait for the pipeline to be flushed out and then reset, re thinking what should it be. It just does it on the fly. At every instance of an acknowledgement coming back, I will do a recomputation. Also, when there is a timeout. That's an absence of AC, but I will still do a recomputation. And just like he was suggesting earlier that, uh, you know, can we do a quicker retransmission sometimes? TCP will do that, and then again we will do a recalculation of our window at that time. So it happens at all, all yeah. Okay, so Friday evening, long weekend coming up. I think this is a good time for us to stop, but before we stop, oops, crap. Move too fast. I just wanted to. Oh, it's it's stuck here. What was I? How long has it been stuck here? You guys should tell me. You know when this happens. I don't know if I was showing anything on the slides or not, but there is one thing I want to show you. This guy. Okay. So have a, a good celebration. Um, and. Uh, I'll see you again on Wednesday. Thanks.